And so the theme of these verses is clearly something of reconciliation. It's a wonderful thing, is it not, to be reconciled? Verse 18, twice, verse 19, verse 21. I think we all like to be reconciled. It means to be restored into friendly relationship. It means to coming together again. Hands up those who don't want to be reconciled. It means we're being restored to unity, restored to harmony. Of course, what it assumes is that there's been a prior falling out, a prior estrangement. And of course, in this case here, it's a horrible estrangement. It's an estrangement in which we are separated from God by our sins. We once knew that horrible estrangement, didn't we? We once weren't reconciled. This table is for those who've been reconciled. And we weren't reconciled once. We were bound by Satan. We were hostile in our minds. We were slaves to sin, lawbreakers, hell deservers. And all that once was true of us is now no longer true in any way, shape, or form. Because he has now reconciled you. He has now reconciled you to himself. It's God you were estranged from, and it's God that you've been reconciled to. God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And in my notes, I'll simply put Sela there, S-E-L-A-H. The word is often found in the Psalms. Do you remember Alan Levy preaching on that many years ago? Well, what do you think of that? He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Now, what do you think of that? But our verse tonight, you've already guessed, is verse 21. How have we been reconciled? It's a glorious thing to be reconciled. Wonderful thing to be reconciled to God, having been estranged from him. But how? How have we been reconciled to God? What did we do to reconcile ourselves to God? And the answer, of course, is nothing. We read here, it's God who has reconciled us to himself. And so verse 21 simply points out three things for us. It's the who of reconciliation, it's the what, or even the how of reconciliation, and it's the why. So we'll consider this, then we'll sing and have a time of open prayer and praise. There was a problem, wasn't there? We were estranged from God. You know, if he should keep a record of our wrongs and treat us accordingly, not one of us could stand. He's perfectly pure and holy and just. And though we bear his image, of course, and retain something of that, yet by nature, as we sometimes sing, we're guilty, vile, and helpless. How can a person be righteous before God? The very best that we offer him is as filthy rags, how can we ever be made righteous? How can we ever be reconciled to him? He can't simply overlook our sin and hope that it disappears into thin air. He's a sin-hating, sin-punishing God. How can he make us right with himself? And of course, the answer is found in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that tremendous exchange of monumental proportion. A double transaction, something is taken from us and laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ and something is taken from him and laid upon us. And so the first thing we're going to consider this evening is simply this. He made him. He made him. And I want you to ponder in your own mind who that him is and what he means to you and how you might describe him. And which titles or offices are particularly precious to you at the moment? They vary, don't they, over time. But just to set the record straight, the hymn that we are considering here is no one less than the eternal Son of God, by whom and for whom the worlds were made. The hymn is the only begotten, the uncreated, the one who is fully man, yes, but at the same time fully God. The one born at Bethlehem, the teacher, the doer of the miracles. I don't know what phrases are particularly choice to you at the moment from the scripture. He's the radiance of the Father's glory. 
sometimes sing that chorus, don't we? Jesus, you are the radiance of the Father's glory. You are the Son, the appointed heir, through whom all things are made. How would you describe him tonight? Would you describe him by the, one of the great I Ams? The him is the one who is the way and the truth and the life. Maybe tonight you describe him by one of his offices. It's particularly precious to you tonight that he was a prophet or a priest or a king. My own phrase at the moment is from Wesley. He's the lover of my soul. This is the him. That's our focus tonight. It's him. And the emphasis of the passage is it's him who knew no sin. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine not knowing sin? It just struck me, wouldn't it be marvellous if we could say, oh, I, I know no sin. And yet the perversity of us is that sometimes we want to know sin, don't we? And yet he, though fully man, is different to us. He knew no sin. And that word know is rich in the Bible, isn't it? Adam knew his wife Eve. It meant to know carnally. Jesus had no engagement with sin. No union with sin. He knew no sin. Him is the one who's spotless, who never sinned, who was uniquely born without a sin nature. In the plan of God's salvation, the one conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who lived in perfect obedience for the entirety of his whole life, Never yielded to temptation. All of his life, he never broke one commandment. You could have watched his life from cradle to grave. No idolatry. Kept the Sabbath. Never murdered. Never got unrighteously angry. Never committed adultery. Never looked lustfully at a woman. Never stole. Never coveted. As a boy, he never sinned. Fully obedient to his parents. You know, he, he was never cantankerous or moody or lied. He never slammed a door in unrighteous anger in the home. He, he never deceived. He never gossiped. He was tempted at all points, just as we are, but without sin. What a marvellous, spotless life. We, in many ways now, we wish that we'd lived such a life, don't we? The beauty of the sinless life. He was innocent of the, the charges that sent him to the cross. A whole list of people in the Bible who admitted in the end there was no fault with him. Pilate said it three times. Pilate's wife said it once. Herod could find no fault with him. The chief priests and the whole of the Sanhedrin could find no false testimony. Judas said, I betrayed innocent blood. Jesus said, who of you can convict me of sin? <laughs> Nobody could. One of the robbers on the cross next to Jesus said, this man has done no wrong. There was something about his life. John says in him there was no sin. Holy, harmless, undefiled. Peter, you saw him. Peter, you, you saw him for, for three years. In fact, you're the one who denied him. What would you say about him? Was he as good as everybody said? Oh, he committed no sin, Peter would say. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Not once, not the whole time. He's a sinless saviour in whom God the Father was well pleased. That's who we're considering tonight. It's him who was a lamb without blemish and needed to be but was. It's Jesus, the lover of our soul. Secondly, how are we reconciled through him? What happened to him what happened to him to effect our reconciliation, to restore us to friendly relationships with God once and for all? And the scripture simply says, he made him who knew no sin. In fact, it doesn't even say to be sin. It simply says, he made him who knew no sin, sin. He made him who knew no sin. Sin. We'll never understand that this side of heaven. Didn't make him a sinner. Didn't make him a rebel by nature. 
didn't make him actually to rebel, but he did make him who knew no sin, sin. He made him to be something that he wasn't. In order that when the Father looked upon him on the cross and dealt with him, he saw sin. And in many ways, I don't think we have got an explanation in that he didn't make him a sinner. He didn't make him a rebel. But surely here it means more than he made him a sin bearer or a sin offering, as some translations have it. It must mean more than that. But what does it mean? What does it really mean, the mystery of Calvary? We do know, Isaiah, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the perversity, the corruption we considered this morning. Our rebellion, our transgression is laid upon him such that he bears it and he carries it. He who knew no sin, he who had no union with sin, he who had no engagement with sin, bears sin. Isaiah says he bore the sin of many, he bore iniquity. The writer of the Hebrews says he was offered once to bear the sins of many. He was certainly bearing our sins. Peter says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. A foul weight of sin was pressed into him. He was bruised, he was crushed. The one who knew no sin, the pure, undefiled, and holy one, was made sin as the sun hides its face. And just as the guilt was said to transfer, wasn't it, to the animal under the sacrificial system, when you put your hands upon the, the sacrifice, your sin symbolically was transferred to the sacrifice, which is why the sacrifice died. So sin was credited to Jesus Christ on the cross as though it was his sin and as though he was the sinner. He was made sin, but that's not the whole of the first part of the sentence, is it? God made him who knew no sin, sin. God made him sin. He was made the object of God's wrath, a bearer of wrath and punishment. God treated his own son on that cross as though he were a thief and a liar. As though he was someone who'd had impure thoughts, been shoddy at work, been short-tempered, as though he was an idolater, as though he was a Sabbath breaker, as though he was a murderer as though he'd got unrighteously angry, as though he committed adultery with a, a lust, lustful look at a woman, as though he was sin itself. God made him who knew no sin, sin. He was made a curse. In a sense, no wonder he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? as he drank down the cup of God's wrath. The pure, undefiled, spotless one, treated as the vilest offender. He knew no sin. He was made sin. Finally, before we come to sing and to respond, you have to ask the question, why, don't you? Why would the Father and the Son agree that the spotless Son should come and be treated in that way upon a cross? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. For us. His natural enemies. 
He did this for us. He came from heaven and went to the cross for us, for all who would believe. He did that on our behalf, for our good. He came as a sin-bearing substitute to remove, to dismiss our sins, to release us. He did so out of love for his bride. I must have my bride. I must go. I must cleanse her. The desire of my heart is to spend an eternity with my bride in unadulterated fellowship with her. I must go and rescue her. I must go and ransom her. I must go and be made sin for her. It's not too high a price for me to pay because I love her. Why did he do it? for us, out of love, and then finally, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That something wonderful would happen to us. I mean, forgiveness of sin is wonderful, but it's only half the story really, isn't it? Through being reconciled, we become something which we're not by nature. We become the righteousness of God in him. We become right with God and start to live righteously. It's the second part of that double transaction. It's the tails to which the other is the heads. He was perfectly, spotlessly obedient all of his life. And that righteousness is then credited to us once and for all. He died with my sins counted against him, pardoning me, as though he was the sinner who'd sinned in all the ways that I've sinned. And now I stand complete in him, his perfect righteousness, always fully counting for me, as though I have lived the entirety of my life in perfect obedience to God. And I sometimes feel that's one of the lacking elements, isn't it, in our lives? It's the great verse of imputation, isn't it? Our sin is imputed to Christ. But also in this verse, his perfect righteousness is imputed to us. It's a funny exchange, isn't it, really? We trade in our sin and we receive his righteousness. Something is taken from us, the very worst, and traded in for something which is given from Christ, the very best. His death pays the price of our sin, but his life is credited to ours for us. So that we are declared righteous and reckoned as sinless, saved, not condemned. And we receive all of that through faith alone. The meal is for the reconciled. We're remembering the one who knew no sin, who was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And my final question is, so what? So what? What difference does it make? What's the application? Let me give you these. Number one, <laughs> surely, sheer wonder. Is this really? Is this real? Is this really for me? Yes, yes. The joy, the thanksgiving, what grace, what love, what cost. Sheer wonder. Ponder it again tonight afresh. Secondly, so what? Well, Humility. No grounds for boasting, is there? What have we done to reconcile ourselves to God? Zilch. God has reconciled us to him through Christ Jesus. Third, faith. Continuing faith. Trust. At times we're miserable, aren't we? Because we're not believing and living in the light of this. And I want to encourage you tonight to look 
afresh to him, look anew to him, have confidence in him. He not only paid the price of your sins, glorious though that is, he's clothed you once and for all in his perfect righteousness. And I wonder if we find the second more difficult to live in the light of than the first. We're always clothed in his perfect righteousness. We're not justified, we're not declared right with God through preaching or listening to preaching. We're not declared righteous through our prayers, through arriving on time at church, through, through being obedient. You know, we really ought to stop looking in the degree to which we do at our failures or our successes. It's a hideously wrong focus. In many ways, you know, it adds to our sin. Because in Christ, we are not now condemned for our failures. And in Christ, we are not accepted for our successes. It's not about them, it's about him. Our sins have been paid for. His success in perfect obedience is the continual grounds for our acceptance with God. And so I'd encourage you to treasure the Lord who is your righteousness. Now, and when you go to bed, and when you wake up, and when you clean your teeth in the morning, and when you put your teeth in, probably do that first. He's your righteousness. It's not about your failures or your successes. Though, of course, as we'll see, you want to please him. But it's a sorry business when we're still so focused on our failures and our successes to the degree that we're not honouring him for who he is. Verse 7 says we are to walk by faith and not by sight. So the application is a sheer wonder, humility, a walking by faith, walking in the light of this. He's my righteousness. Now and always. Verse 15 says we're to live no longer for ourselves, but to him who died and rose again. We are free now to live for him. Verse 9, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. That's what I want to do this week. In my thoughts, in my desires, in my words, in my actions in what I read and how I read, in what I watch, I want to be well-pleasing to him. And last implication, I don't think we are ambassadors to the degree that Paul is here. I think he's speaking there of being an apostle, but nevertheless, we are to implore others to be reconciled to God through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a marvellous thing to be reconciled. We were once afar off. We've been brought near. Friendly relations with no one less than God has been restored. How? Because God made him who knew no sin. Sin. For us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're going to sing 500 from New Christian Hymns. I'm 